I just got back from RePC and I found something interesting in the software bin there. I'm not sure what to think of it. MicroStar Software Club. There's a whole bunch of these. And they're all different colors and they're labeled. Number 572, Seafoam Green. I don't even see a label on this one. Number 151, Rusty Gold. That's Rusty Gold. Number 300, Royal Blue. And this one, not labeled. Yeah, so they're sealed. Uh, they've never been opened, and I don't have any idea what they are. I tried Googling them, and of course I got nothing. So what I'm hoping, uh, especially considering the era, these are all copyright 1997, it looks like. I'm hoping this is a collection of bad old software, and that we can explore it and maybe have some fun. So, I'm going to break the seal. Got it. Okay. Okay, I was not expecting that. All right. Before running the program. Okay. I'm not sure what I'm installing here. I have no idea what's about to happen. Okay, we're apparently going to install onto C. Uh, MS Club, okay. Uh, okay. Oh. Oh, this interface is bad. I can either turn these on or off, or I can select all, but it doesn't deselect those. Oh no. Uh. So apparently I have to either pick programs to install totally blind, or I can just install everything and then figure it out after the fact. I don't have a lot of space on here, so I better figure out how much space that's gonna take up before I do it. Well, there's 410 megs used. Yeah, I don't know, so I guess I just have to assume that this is going to install 410 megs of stuff, so I'd better free up some space if I can. Alright, there we go. I just completed making a new partition on this hard drive since Windows only made a 2GB partition when it installed. So now I have space to install everything. So let's just do this again. Alright, and this time I'm going to go through each one of these and do select all. Okay. Okay, we installed the business programs. Let's do the education programs. Onwards to the games. General interest programs. It was like an Aquid strip thing. Ah, Turbo Files. Max Hit. Home program. <laughs> what the fuck are we about to install? Turbo Files! <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Turbo files. They're gonna be so fast. Give me the quickest files. Okay, graphics. Files running too slow. Try turbo files. Are your files just not fast enough anymore? Try turbo files for a step up into the Indy 500 of files. Don't forget to ask for free shipping. God, I just, like, I don't know what I'm installing here. I'm just installing. So I'm excited about these clip art images. 
but I'm particularly excited about browser feature internet tutorials. Yeah. Now, none of those were apparently Windows 95 programs. I apologize, by the way, for the mustache. I didn't think to shave before I started this one. I just got home, you gotta understand. Okay, that's it. Whatever the hell we just installed, it's all installed. So, ostensibly I installed these, but I suspect these are all installers. I think I installed some installers. Yes, I did. Alright, so I'm just gonna be a jackass and I'm gonna start out with a game. Yeah! Select destination. Yeah! Alright, didn't work. That was slick. Thanks to our testers, which didn't notice our ridiculous font problems. Okay, but we gotta go back for a second because I need to tell you something. So that moment where it says the music composer is nicknamed The Thin Man, that is a response to an extremely well-established video game music composer in the 90s who was nicknamed The Fat Man. Okay, I don't know what this program is, because here I'm trying to make a new game, and it's asked me what drive to make it on. What the hell? This is so strange. Of course I'm going to be a shark, are you kidding? Oh no. Oh no, I know what this is. Commencing launch sequence. Oh no, look at that very poorly scaled shark. Penetrating space. Select destination. Oh no. I'm I'm racing the other programs on my computer apparently. My ship is respectable, everyone. Oh, God. It, it's got actual windows windows. Oh my god, this is, uh... Oh! Ah! So I guess I can't destroy this guy, so I guess I'll just beat him at the race. Well, if I can control my shark. My shark in space makes a burning rubber noise when I drift. What? There's just no course now, why?
What was the point of that? Why was I racing other programs? Why were they just up there at the top? I mean, they weren't actually the ships or anything. I don't understand. What was the point of it? Please stay. I won't, actually. I'm sorry. Order today. I'm not going to do that either. Okay, that was bizarre. So let's go look at some productivity software now. I'm going to jump right into this graphics situation. So is this a 3D graphing? <laughs> Oh, that's very ugly. Bing. Well. Well, oh, okay. Oh, this is just dog slow. I, I don't know whether it's slow because it's on a Pentium or if it's slow because the software's just terrible. I'm thinking it could be either one. I mean, this does, I guess I can't deny that it does, it does make a graph. I'm not sure what this detail setting does. Oh, well, I guess that's low detail for you. Oh, is that like the number of, it's like the number of iterations or something, but it'll let you set it so low that it won't actually complete the graph. Okay, so I'm gonna guess that this software was again meant to be garbage, that it was just market dumped because it is very, very easy to write a graphing calculator if you know anything about graphics programming and anything about math. So I'm guessing this was just meant to be junk from the get go. It sure looks like it. It's almost a rule that if you start a Windows application from this era and the background is not default gray, that you're gonna have a bad time. That's usually the mark of a very low quality developer. Okay, so that's shit. Next program. Facts perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, dirty days left. Uh, continue. Okay, so in theory, this is a fax program. Now that's cute. I'm already actually kind of intrigued by this because it offers a whole bunch of different ways to process an image in order to dither it into facts. So that's that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and... Okay, so this supports just uh, any kind of uh, common native Windows format of the time. Yeah, let's find something... Let's find something that actually has a perceivable image. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think that'll do it. Oh, even better. Let's add that. Um, let's add a small image and see what it does with that. Let's add a low contrast image, a uh, really bad low contrast image. Uh, let's add this one here. Yeah, let's just do everything in there. Um, a low res image. So let's make our facts. Let's see, can we zoom at all? I don't see an option for zooming, so I, I guess we just have to look at, at what we've got here. Okay, so it did handle the small images okay. Um, the low contrast one is obviously ruined. I'm not really surprised by that. Uh, this looks like it actually came out pretty reasonable. Let's see what happens if we adjust the brightness or contrast. Okay, so it actually, yeah, it takes time to reprocess that. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, let's see what a 12 weight looks like. Okay. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, they would serve different different purposes in different cases, so that's pretty good. Let's see, in fact, can we make this look better by using any of these other dithering modes? No, that one's just, uh, I think, unrecoverable. And then this one here, because I think because it was so low resolution, it, it doesn't look too hot. I mean, it's still, you can still make out what it is. Yeah, you know, I guess you can, you can, you can clean that up, really, uh, with some adjustment. You can make that look a little bit better. Let's see what happens if we uh, dial this up until... I guess I'd rather probably see that at the top of fax rather than that or that. So, yeah, there's an argument there. Yeah, the other dithering modes do pretty bad for this, but maybe they would work okay on photos or something. And I'd say that uh, Error Diffusion or Floyd Steinberg Fuzzy ends up making that look a little bit better than the 12 or 4 weight. So that's cool. Now one question I have, um, let's open up MS Paint and see if we can pull these converted pictures out of here. Oh, and we can. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, so if nothing else, uh, this program offers me a way to convert images to uh, one bit. Yeah, there it is. Let's race that against MS Paint's own image conversion because it can convert to one bit as well but I don't think it does nearly as good a job okay let's convert to black and white 
So it didn't do as nearly good a job, but I think I know which version that is. I think that's the uh, angled dot. Yep. Oh yeah, it's literally it's literally the identical algorithm. Look at that. Okay, so what's the point of this is my question. It looks like it can convert these images to one bit, but then what? Is is this just a processor so you can then put them into a real fax program? Oh yeah, there it is. It's just a it's just an image half toner. So it's not actually supposed to make faxes, it's just supposed to convert the bitmaps to a half tone so that you can send them. That's certainly valuable. Yeah, there we go. Most fax programs and print drivers do not handle the conversion of color graphics. So their intent was just to fill this gap where you could fax from your computer, but anything that faxed would convert your images either very poorly or wouldn't send them at all. So that's a that's a good program. Okay, so obviously next I want to look at Smart Draw. So it says it's expired. Oh, okay, I see. It's the very poor trial implementation. Okay. Yeah, empty drawing. Okay, all right. So here we are, and I'm going to say... This looks like probably something for making flowcharts and that sort of thing, like a like a low rent Visio. We can make objects and then yeah, yeah. In fact, who uh, who made this? Smart Draw Software Incorporated. So apparently this was their product, like their sole product. There's no object anti-aliasing. Kind of a shame. Yeah, you can do um, fill shading, different types of borders. Well, that's interesting. You can um, you can actually change what primitive a shape is using after you've created it. So that's kind of cute. We can add text to it. Oh, so this is cool. So this thing is an auto connector line. It says so. Apparently, we drop it on here, and now it will just become infectious and create chains automatically. So that's cute. It's kind of a neat tool. Uh, in that it allows you to automatically create chains. So in theory, I could just keep keep adding stuff down here and it would just automatically, see it just pops in there and automatically puts lines on the other side. The problem is that it looks like if you delete any of them, it deletes them all. So how is that supposed to work? I don't really get how you're supposed to use that. What if there's nothing to be done at the beginning or end? Uh, that was an interesting decision to make. Uh, one thing I find frustrating is that when you're drawing a connecting line, you can't actually see where the anchor points are before you begin drawing. You have to click, and then you'll see them. And, yeah, then, then it seems to want to do that. Oh, you know what it is? I actually, I rotated that earlier. Yeah, and it just got super confused. So it, it supports rotation, but it doesn't really understand it. Because from this side with it rotated it thinks it's on the other side and has to exit the wrong way that's weird okay so we have text options we can make the text bigger subscript and superscript which i'm guessing work only in editing yeah yeah there we go oh okay all right so it is full rich text i just didn't have anything selected earlier uh, it is a little irritating that it automatically inherits the fill and shading and everything it just does that when you make a new object instead of defaulting it to something. Oh, you can make the curved line auto connectors. That's uh, pretty cute. I, I actually am not offended by that. You can make round rects and you can actually decide how round you want them to be. I'm always irritated when I can't adjust the roundness of my rects. Okay, so that's a pretty basic drawing app for Visio style stuff. There is something in here about libraries. Uh, so let's pick EE circuits. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's cute. Oh, well, I didn't mean to dock that, but now that I have, it appears that it actually becomes a toolbar. And you can either drag the default template or you can draw one of an arbitrary size. Uh, it looks like they do have, they got your standard Cisco computer icons for network stuff. Yeah, I can't get away from that. So yeah, um, it really looks like this is a Visio competitor. Uh, I think this came out in 97. Yeah, 97. I feel like Visio was probably out by then. Yeah, so in 1997, Visio was in at least version 4. So they certainly knew what they were duplicating. Oh, and look at that. Oh, no. Oh, no, you can give the entire thing a style. There's like a, a style option for the entire page. Uh, I gotta say, that that's kind of cute. Yeah, it, it doesn't really work very well. Like, I want it to work very well. I would like it to be wonderful, but in reality, I, I think it is pretty dumb. See, like, for instance, it supports a stark black and white mode, but it doesn't actually render the stark black and white mode very well. Well, actually, I mean, I guess it...
does pretty well if there's none of these silly fills. And to be frank, I I think I was pretty, just being pretty obnoxious with the fills. So yeah, once we do that, it doesn't look too bad. Let's let's go back and try that 3D again. Yeah, I mean, except for the computers over there, it looks pretty good. Again, except for the computers there. Can we actually uh, put a fill on these? Oh, much better, much better. I'm having a hard time fighting this, especially because it's pretty vaporwave. This right here, that's gonna be my logo for something. Take a look at that. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good, actually. All right, there we go. That is an excellent logo for a 1997 Hydro Systems Supply Company, whatever those are. I definitely have a hard time arguing with this. You can also make some absolutely beautiful 1993 aesthetic art with this. I wonder, can we export an image from this? Oh yeah, uh, any format you like. Okay, let's see if it anti-aliased it when it exported it. I really doubt it. Uh, it didn't do dick, other than spit this gibberish all over here. All the same though, like, hey, that's a pretty good image. I like it. Yeah, I'm gonna say, honestly, that was a lot better than I expected. That was a pretty good Vizio knockoff, all things considered. I mean, I'd guess that at 1997, Vizio probably cost $100. If they were selling this thing for anything less, probably they were making a steal. Actually, as it turns out, I checked an old copy of PC Magazine from 1996, and it appears that Vizio 5.0 was the current version, and it was $350. So these folks had a long way to go to undercut Vizio. It wouldn't have taken much. So if they were selling for 100 or even 150 they were definitely a competitor in the market. I mean, it seemed to be able to do everything that Vizio needed to do. I would have made flowcharts with that. Hell, I might still. Okay. So I just launched the icon wizard here, and it's terrible. So I'm gonna lead you through it real quick. So first I wanna point out, look at the icon wizard icon. It's terrible and presumably made in their own software. So that doesn't bode well. Next, check out the close button. It's disabled, why? Check this out. I'm gonna select black. And of course, it's not very clear where the color is going. It's actually over here off to the right, but that's, that's a very weird way to, to, to make that. Anyway, so watch this. It took that long to paint, what, 32 by 32 pixels? Okay, so now let's draw a box, and it doesn't show you what the line will look like until you let go. And then it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, for some reason, it'll only draw in the upper, like, 8 pixels. I, I have no idea why. The, I can draw down here with the pencil, and, and that works okay, but, yeah, this doesn't. Well... Wait, what just happened? I drew some stuff here, and then... Yeah, okay, so that's a quick nope. This thing just is gibberish. This program is unfinished. It's not even ready for anyone to see. This is like someone's development version that got released by accident. Okay, so let's look at the general interest software. What is Turbo Files? Ah, intuitive data storage from Turboware. Freeform and user-definable information stored within multiple topics. What does that mean? We've done our best to also install program launching icons. That's a weird way to say it. Okay, so it, it's a it's a Rolodex. You can edit the labels of all fields. You can have many entries in this table. Each entry can have two data items. Entries are sorted by their descriptions. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, this, this is about right. Um, this is a pretty normal piece of crapware from the 90s, uh, basically supposed to be a replacement for, theoretically, a you know, paper notebook you would use to inventory things that you own. I don't think anyone ever actually used these things. I think they were solely a fantasy. I don't think anyone ever managed to, to discipline themselves to use one. I'm noticing that this is clearly oriented towards movies because we've got drama, comedy, and action over here. And then director released 
Uh, yeah, stars. This looks like it might be part of a editable forms system, though I don't see how to edit it. Okay, all right, so it's probably not directly editable. Uh, what I notice here is I can open another one of these and I get different titles, but it's all fixed fields. So essentially what this is, is a very, very basic database with uh, renameable fields. Okay, yeah, I see how it works. We can, uh, we can make another topic, which is what it calls a tab. And there we go. We can add a album. Okay, and then within the album, we can add a individual song. Okay, so again, this is a pretty typical piece of 90s crapware. Uh, this was basically created in order to convince somebody that they were going to be able to organize their life. And so you had to take whatever it was you were trying to organize and cram it into this concept here. And I don't know, maybe this worked for somebody because what this is replacing essentially is a paper notebook that would contain the same information. Well, if you're using a paper notebook, unless you were going to go through every single page and score lines for each of the fields that you were going to add, in reality, you would probably just kind of be cramming it into whatever notebook shape Whatever. In reality, you would probably be cramming it into whatever template you could get in a notebook. So you'd be getting something that was pre-printed like a day planner and putting all your info in there. So this is probably no more restrictive than that. It's just, uh, you know, someone probably paid money for this. And once the data was in here, you probably couldn't get it back out in any sort of normal format. So if you lose the software or whatever, your data is just gone. And indeed, there's no way to actually save a file. You can print. But that's it. And I'll bet if we go check, there'll just be one big file named like .dat. Yeah, it's just a, looks like probably a, either a fixed width or maybe, maybe even variable width. But it's, 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 it's essentially a CSV file. It's just not using commas for separators. Well, okay, so that was Turbo Files. At least it was quick, though I guess I shouldn't be surprised. It was Turbo. Okay, moving on. What is home program? I have to know what home program is. Oh, it's supposed to be some sort of home automation system designed to be used without a keyboard. You can use a touch screen. Wow, it looks like this will even integrate with uh, with X10. Homewa. Homewa. Well, that's creepy. Uh, the purpose of all those REMs is to hide what it was doing. I want to know what it was doing. Okay. Uh, remove batch file. Okay, nothing nefarious. No lords, no masters, crescent moon... Okay, I would really like to get a look at that startup screen before we continue. So I'm going to close this and restart it. Okay, what, what do we have going on here? This part of the image looks like it was done by a bad, but nonetheless a professional graphics designer. And then this looks terrible. And something I want to point out is that I think, I could be wrong here, but I think this is about the dimensions of a business card. So I'm thinking that this person who made this, and I guarantee this is made by one person, this person actually got business cards designed and then just took the, the bitmap they were sent and put that into their program. Okay, so obviously this looks bad, but there's, there's more to it. I'm kind of curious how they're drawing this interface because if I resize the window, watch what happens. Yeah. So it seems to me that they're just drawing everything manually in software rather than using any sort of, of Windows GDI. First things first, moods. We need to pick a mood. Oh, no. Uh. Uh. Well, I'm fucked. Okay, let's, let's try again because I, I fucked up. Okay, so house is locked. Okay, so apparently that puts me into house locked mode, but if I hit view house, it grinds for a bit. And then, look at that, it's some sort of, or it's intended to be some sort of drawing of the house, but it's just mangled. Okay, there's not much under file or options. What would print be? I wonder if print would have just printed whatever was on the screen. Uh, okay, so electric and temperature, living room. Okay, yeah, there we go. That's So this is X10 integration, for sure. Uh, so I guess I hit exit? Oh, okay, yeah, it's in there. Uh, how would we get rid of it, I wonder? Oh, I clicked the burning radioactive trash can to get rid of it. Very good. 
Okay, so it has a phone dialer. I'm kind of wondering how that works. So the phone dialer is, of course, absolutely terrible. And one of the ways it's terrible is if you dial and you put in a area code, it puts in these parentheses, and then the parentheses never redraw. So if you look down here on the bottom of this box here, you can see that there's leftover parenth. And the same goes for down here, where you can see leftover text from this. And this is problematic as well. So if you start dialing, it will figure out where you're dialing from some internal phone number database, which is of course out of date. So I can dial 206 and it'll understand that I'm calling Seattle somewhere. But if I try to dial 425, it fails and defaults to North Carolina. So well, that's bad. Also, if I hit local or long distance, it automatically puts in North Carolina, but then it completely breaks the rest of the dialing decoding. So now I can just arbitrarily delete parts of this and it'll get confused. I was born 16,000 days ago and here are my biorhythms. This program was written. It sure was. I swear to God, I think Ray Smuckles from Akewood made this program. Yeah, so this is stunningly bad and clearly the people who compiled this CD didn't even bother to look at it. But who's surprised? So that was bad. Okay, I tried to install this thing called Simona Planner and it just doesn't work. Uh, there's a shortcut here for a program that wasn't installed at all. All right, what do we have for business software? See, again, there's some programs here that just, just didn't appear to get installed, period. Oh no, it did get installed. Wild. Oh, oh, I just saw something. I saw Fox Pro. This is a Fox Pro app. Oh boy, I wanna tell you about Fox Pro. So back in the 80s, there was a desire for home computers to do databases. But what is that? So a database, if you're an uninitiated, how to put it, it's a structured way of storing data. So for instance, if you wanted to store some information on your computer about what DVDs you have in your DVD collection, because you're still collecting DVDs, because I made this video in 2006, if you wanted to make a DVD collection file on your computer, you could just open up Notepad and start typing. Okay, but there's problems with that. What if you want to find all DVDs that were released in 2001? Well, you can go to the file and hit Control F and type in 2001 and just start hitting Enter over and over. And of course, you'll catch every movie that has 2001 in the ISBN. And it's also a lot of effort. And also, once you do find the movie, you can't actually identify any of the data unless you wrote next to every piece of data what that data was, which is a lot of work. It's also really ugly and it's really limiting. And what if you want to add a value to every single one of those entries at the same time? Like, for instance, you decide one day that you want to add a column that says currently in my collection because you want to start loaning movies out and you want a place you can store whether you do or don't have it right now. Okay, well, you're going to have to go through every single entry and manually go to the end, press space, type in the header, do I have it, and then type in the field, yes. You're going to have to do that for 200, 300, 400, however many DVDs you have. Okay, so what you can do with a home database instead is... You make a template, a form, if you will, for your DVD collection. And so that's going to be a page that has fields for the title of the DVD, a short description, like the blurb from the back, maybe who's in it, maybe who published it, maybe who produced it, maybe who the director was, what year it was released, how many discs it is, and whether you have it in your house. And if you don't have it in your house, then who'd you loan it to? So there's a lot more to databases as a concept, but... What the home user wanted in the 90s, in the 80s, was that. They wanted the ability to catalog their recipes. They wanted a place to store their info on what books were in their home library, that sort of thing. So there was a whole slew of database apps that came to the rescue starting in the 80s on the early home computers. Because back then, you had to have a reason to buy a home computer, and no one had made that yet. I mean, you'll hear a lot if you watch some documentaries on vintage computers, you'll hear a lot about killer apps. This is the sort of thing that should have been a killer app. Kind of wasn't, though. And the reason for that is that making a database just isn't very easy. It's a lot of work. Databases are a very computer concept, and humans just don't think in them na naturally. So as a 43-year-old in 1985, you might have bought a home computer and gotten a database package for it, but whether you were going to be able to figure out how to use it was another story entirely. 
I think in a lot of cases, those database apps just ended up being abandoned and the person never did make their recipe collection database. So consequently, there was a push at all times through the 80s and 90s, and I think into the 2000s maybe, to come up with a database that anyone could use. On the flip side, there was also businesses which were needing their own database solutions. And I think, this is my theory about this, that at some point the two sort of smashed into each other. So there was this package called DBase that was popular with businesses and individuals alike. Uh, I've actually met people who had DBase databases in the mid 2000s. They were keeping DBase databases for their personal inf information, stuff that they owned and, and bills they have paid and stuff like that. And DBase was considerably easier to use and a lot more capable than a lot of other database packages. And most importantly, it supported a programming language that was built into it, that was unique to it. That was sort of like, uh, kind of like COBOL or Fortran in the sense that it was very purpose-built. And it was written in kind of a basic-esque sort of syntax where you typed out whole English words instead of symbols. And uh, it wasn't very clean and it wasn't very good, but it did work and you could make arbitrarily complex apps in it if you were willing to deal with its limitations. So DBase was absurdly popular. Uh, they got up to, I think, major release four, I want to say. So I'm not sure what happened next. This is a part that's a little vague to me. I don't know if people started ripping off DBase or if DBase started licensing their design out to other people or what, but a whole bunch of variants appeared. And one of them that was well known to me was Clipper because I actually used a cash register point of sale package once that was written entirely in Clipper. And then another one was Foxbase. And Foxbase was, as far as I understand, I haven't actually looked at it yet, but as far as I can tell, Foxbase was also just a direct DBase knockoff. So then Foxbase was being developed by Fox Software, and they eventually changed the name to Fox Pro, and then it got bought by Microsoft, and I think at that point ported to Windows. Okay, so now Fox Pro for Windows was a graphical database app where you could create forms in a GUI. So you'd actually have like drop down fields where you could make a form field in the database that could only have one of a certain number of values. And then you could pick one of those values and then it would validate other fields based on that and that sort of thing. And I think you could write arbitrarily complex macro code in it as well so that you could make an entire application with fairly sophisticated logic, like actual business logic entirely in Fox Pro. And I think that there were actually entire like point of sale systems that ended up getting made using this that were, were all just inside of one big Fox Pro file. So in that sense, it's a lot like Microsoft Access, which I'm pretty sure is another DBMS that they just bought from another company the same way they did with this one. Uh, but they eventually sort of left Fox Pro by the wayside. I think it might be gone now completely unless they're still... They're probably still rolling some version for support of very, very old companies. But I know that Microsoft has shifted onto Access entirely, and Access is really no different. It's, it's the same concept. It's just more modern, less debasey. So I think that there was a way to export a Fox Pro file to an application that would basically come with the Fox Pro runtime. So you would run this thing, and it was hard coded to open up a you know .fxp file or whatever and just load it directly. And I think that's what this application is. I think this is just a Fox Pro file that they sold as a business package. And to be honest, that's absolutely awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it works. Unfortunately, you'll have to look forward to seeing how it works as well, because it refuses to run on my machine. Since I'm running Windows Me on 64 megs of RAM, I suspect that I've basically tapped out the memory resources on this machine. I went to the RePC and I picked up a whole bunch of old SD RAM and newer SD RAM, and none of it works. After doing some research online, it appears that I need something called low density RAM. I've heard of this before, but I'm not really sure how to identify it. So I've ordered some stuff on eBay and hopefully once it arrives, I'll be able to get this machine upgraded enough to run this software. If and when that happens, I'll go ahead and post book it. But I thought I would explain the databases for you anyway, and hopefully you got something out of that. Anyway, that's the end of this video and thank you so much for joining me and I hope that you'll join me again in the future.